right, welcome to Compass, our mission's navigating people to God. My name's Nate. I'm the campus pastor here at Compass North Fort Worth, and we're so glad that you're here, so glad that you're worshiping with us. And if you're a guest of ours, an extra special welcome to you today. Uh, We'd love to meet you after the service is over, and we have a gift that we'd like to give you in our Next Steps area, which is just at the back of the room there. And so after the service is over, if you just want to head there and say, hey, I just came for my free gift, we will hand you the gift. Uh, We'd love to connect with you in that way, and we're so glad that you're here. And we're excited about what God's doing here at Compass North Fort Worth. God is up to some amazing things. Well, you know, a few years ago, uh, some strange things happened. Uh, There was a Netflix TV show that came out called Stranger Things, and it became this instant phenomenon, so much so that uh, no matter where you go at Target, you can find Stranger Things memorabilia. In fact, I was at Target the other day, and there's a whole section of Stranger Things memorabilia, everything from shot glasses to coffee mugs to uh, socks to hats to T-shirts. Even you can get the bobbleheads of the Stranger Things characters. And this show has really taken off. In fact, when the show came out a couple of years ago, Forbes magazine said this about it. It was the summer's defining moment. And the first season of Stranger Things ended up drawing 21.7 million viewers in the first season. That's second most all time in Netflix history. It is now the number one ranked show on Netflix of all time. And it's a show that's loved by both fans and critics everywhere. It's won numerous awards and it has this huge following. And you know, my guess is that just by the title of this, this message, you, you probably understand what this show's about, right? It's about these strange things that are happening in this small town called Hawkins, Indiana. There are these paranormal and supernatural things that tend to happen, and they, they believe there to be this upside-down world or unseen world that exists. And you know, that's not unlike what we find in Scripture today and even what we believe to be true. And so whether or not... Um, You've seen the show or not, and I'm not going to spoil any more of it for you. You get the basic idea of what the show is about. And look, this kind of stuff gets our attention, doesn't it? I mean, we're interested in things that we can't see, things that we've maybe heard of, and, and we want to know more, we want to understand more about, and, and maybe we wait in anticipation for, for what's coming next. Those are the kind of things that we're intrigued by. And so uh, through this series, we want to uh, kind of wrestle with some of the questions that, that we oftentimes bring into this place, like what happens when I die? Or uh, are we living in the end times? That's a question that a lot of people have, and they look at what's going on in the world, and they think, well, I'm living in the end times. And then we ask questions like, well, is the afterlife real? Do heaven and hell, do they exist? Are those real places? And also, are angels and demons, are those real beings? And so what our hope is to do through this series is to draw back the invisible curtain to look at what scripture has to say about these stranger things that are around us every single day. And so today we're kicking off this series and we're digging into this idea of the afterlife. And hopefully by the end of this message today, uh, maybe I'll be able to help you answer this question a little bit better on a maybe a deeper level of what happens when I die. Because the reality is that for each of us here, I think this is something that we at least think about from time to time. Like some of you here, you, you can't wait for the next life, that you're ready for the next life and you're thinking about what's next and that, that excites you. Well, others of you, you're a little bit scared about that. And, and I think it's a pretty good reality for us to kind of to fix our eyes on today to realize that death is something that is inevitable, right? Like, like the last time I checked, the mortality rate is 100%. We are all going to die. But here's the thing. What I want you to hear today is this, and hopefully what you leave here today understanding is this, that death doesn't have to be the end, but instead it can be the beginning, the most amazing experience of your life. And it's through what I want to talk about today and through this statement, I want to dig into what this really means for us to cause ourselves to live with this anticipation of what is still to come and to realize that that, that death doesn't have to be the end but it can be this defining moment in the most amazing experience in our life. And look, I think that that all of us come in here today living in a constant state of anticipation about things, right? Think think about some of the things that you might even anticipate in life. Like as a kid, you anticipate your birthday and Christmas and the presents 
that you'll receive as you get a little bit older. Maybe you get to that point where you're anticipating having your own driver's license and being able to, to go on the road without mom and dad telling you to slow down or to stop a little bit quicker or those things like that. Or maybe, maybe it's your first date and then your first kiss. Or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's your wedding day. You anticipate that. You anticipate the birth of a child. Maybe for some of you here today, you've, you're kind of later in life and you're anticipating retirement and what, what happens after work is over. You know, for me, when I think about some of the things that I anticipated in life, one of the things that I that always look forward to is Christmas, even as an adult. Like, I love Christmas. And Christmas is just amazing. I, I, I can't even go to sleep, even as an adult, because I, I'm so excited about Christmas morning. But, you know, as I thought about these things that we anticipate in life, I thought, these things, all they all come, they, they go, don't they? Like they, They're here, and then they're over in a flash. Christmas morning comes, and before you know it, everybody's taking down the decorations, and Christmas is over. Or your birthday comes, and it's gone in a flash. You get your driver's license, and you're excited because you finally get to drive around without mom and dad, but then that excitement begins to wear off over time, and then you get to my age, and you just want somebody to Uber you around everywhere, right? I mean, the anticipation of what's next, it, uh, when it comes to things in life, those things wear off over time and the excitement wears off and it's gone and what happens is we move on to the next thing. You know, I came across this quote, which I, I think sums this up pretty well. Listen to what it said. It said, even if we manage to escape some of the bigger tragedies in life, which few of us do, life rarely matches our expectations. Every vac- vacation eventually comes to an end Friends often move away, and when we don't get a taste of what we really long for, it never lasts. But let me tell you, what I want to talk about today, I, I, I believe, is something that I'm anticipating that won't have the same wear-off effect. It won't have the same letdown, and I'm positive that when it happens, it's going to keep happening over and over again, and this excitement will never weigh off. Now, uh, Paul, who we talked about last week, who transformed his life, he was a guy who wanted nothing to do with Jesus, and then Jesus kind of hits him on the road to Damascus one day. He has this encounter. Everything changes for him. He then becomes a messenger for God. And Paul, he was writing to some, some early Christians living in this area called Corinth, who are kind of going through a little bit of the discouragement that we sometimes go through in our own lives when it comes to to what happens next in life. And listen to what he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. This is from the message translation. He says this. He says, we don't yet see things clearly. And we're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. And we'll see it all then. See it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly as he knows us. And you see, these words are a promise that, that something better is available to each of us. We, we don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And Matthew, who was one of Jesus' disciples, he said this in Matthew 24, 36, no one knows the day or the hour. We, we don't know the day or the hour when Jesus is going to return, but the promise is that Jesus will come back one day. And we ought to live in anticipation of what happens after our life here on this earth ends. And so today, really what I want us to see, what I hope that you hear more than anything else is that death doesn't have to be the end, but instead it can be the beginning of the most amazing experience of your life. And I wanna show you how that's possible today. And here's the thing. I think when we think about the afterlife, for some people, the thought of next, what's next really isn't something that excites them. That, that some of you might be here today though on the other side of that and you can't wait to get there because of everything that's going on and you're just like, I just want this next life to begin. And I think a lot of that has to do with our understanding of this question of what happens when I die. You know, a few years ago, I was preparing a message much like this one uh, on heaven and I was, I was uh, asking my friends on Facebook and Twitter uh, to, to just give me some thoughts about what they thought heaven was gonna be like, what, what the next life was gonna be like, and, and people had all kinds of different responses to this. Some of the responses that I received were that, that it would be reunited with loved ones. That was something that they couldn't wait for. Other people talked about finally getting to be in the arms of Jesus or finally being at home. I had a family that we were really close friends with who saw my post and they, they had had multiple miscarriages and they said, finally being able to hold our babies that we never got to meet in our arms for the very first time. 
And you know, as I read through the list of the things that were, were, were said on Facebook and Twitter, there were some really powerful and I think accurate answers of what we can expect to experience when we die. But you know, despite the positive responses that I received, I received some apprehensions and fears as well from others about what the future holds after we die. And for some of you here today, maybe, maybe when you think about what's next, maybe when you begin to imagine the afterlife and what heaven is going to be like, you, you've got this picture that heaven is going to be like just one long extended church service. And you're not really that excited about that. Like, like you, you were like, you know, Rob and the band, they're amazing. And I could listen to them for about an hour, but then I'd get tired of singing. My vocal cords would get worn out. Or maybe you think like, oh man, Nate, he's an okay pastor and he, he's a decent speaker, but, and I know God's going to be better than that as a speaker, but I don't want to sit in a chair all day long and I don't want to worship and, and I'm really not into the church choir scene. So that, that's not for me. That's not my vibe. Or, or maybe when you think about heaven, you're like thinking about these babies in diapers floating on clouds playing the harp and that really doesn't excite you, right? But that's not what heaven's going to be like at all. But I think that that's our thought sometimes. You know, I came across this quote uh, that David Lloyd Gregg wrote that said this. He said, when I was a boy, the thought of heaven used to frighten me more than the thought of hell. I thought that was kind of scary. I pictured heaven as a place where time would be perpetual Sundays with perpetual service from which there would be no escape. And you know, today my goal is to, to maybe help you leave here with a different idea, a different view than you came in of what happens when this life ends and that this message would, would fill you with hope and it would cause you to live in anticipation of what is still ahead. And I believe that this message is for you no matter where you're at in your spiritual journey. Like I know that there, there are some of you that have walked into this place today who, who are skeptical about this whole idea of whether or not heaven and hell are real places. Or maybe you've walked into this place today and the church is a place that you're a little bit jaded by because of people who called themselves followers of Christ and you're not even sure if this guy Jesus is someone you want to follow. I want you to know that this message is for you. But this message is also for those of us who are firmly grounded in our faith because I believe this message today will help to draw back the invisible curtain to reveal more clearly of who God is and what he can still do in your life. Now, if you've got a Bible or a Bible app on your smartphone, I want you to turn with me to the book of Revelation. Now, some of you are like, oh, I can't believe he's going to Revelation today. Well, we're going to Revelation. And Revelation is the last book in the New Testament. Uh, it's a book that was written by this guy named John. Now, we talked about John a few weeks ago. John, we said, was one of Jesus' disciples. And John, he referred to himself, remember, we said he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. And it might be true based upon the fact that John got an, an in, in, un, in close and up close and personal view of what heaven was going to be like and what was going to come. And so as John gets to see a little bit of heaven, he begins to write down what he sees so that we could see what it would be like as well. And as John writes in Revelation 21, he, he gives us as much detail and description as he can so that we, as we read it, we get this picture for ourselves of what heaven would be like. Now, John's stay doesn't last very long, but as John is there, you can sense that John's mind is like, he's like blown away by all that he sees and he writes all of it down so that we too might get a taste of what's next. Now, I want to encourage you um, to read this week Revelation 21 and 22. Because whenever I read Revelation 21 and 22, I can't help but get excited to think about the afterlife. Because as you pull back the invisible curtain, you find out God reveals to us some amazing, some amazing things about the end of this life and the beginning of the next. Now, I'll be honest with you, what I'm covering today really, really only scratches the surface of Revelation. I mean, what John writes throughout the book of Revelation is really pretty powerful, and there's not really enough time to dig into this. Like, we could spend a whole year in the book of Revelation because there's just so much in there. But I do want to give you kind of an idea, an overview of what Revelation is about, because I think that that Revelation can be a book that oftentimes scares us and we don't even want to open it because we don't understand things like dragons and fire and all the other things that are going on in there. And so we just don't even read it. But a few years ago, I was at a conference and a professor from Abilene Christian University was speaking and he summed up the book of Revelation the best that I've ever heard and he simply said it this way. He said, when you want to understand what Revelation is about, it's this, God wins, pick a team and don't be stupid. 
I really like that. Like that resonates with me because I think a lot of times what happens when we get to Revelation is we get so caught up in the, in the little details and some of us might be premillennialists, some of us are amillennialists. I don't know what kind of millennialist I am, but I didn't even know I was in the millennialist. I thought I was a generation X or whatever. I don't even know what generation I live in. Anyway, I'm getting off track here. I gotta keep going. And what happens is we miss the most important things in life. That, that's really what happens. And so we get to the end of this life and rather than moving on to the next and really having a, a clear vision, we're so confused that we really don't know what's going on. And I think what we have to understand more than anything else when it comes to the book of Revelation is this, that God wins and we want to be on his team. Now look at what John says starting in verse one that kind of sets this up for us. Revelation 21, he says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. And as John begins to describe heaven, he, he gives us the promise of what heaven will be like. And as we look forward to heaven, we get the image that he wanted us to see. Notice what he says here in these verses. This is what he wants us to hear. He says, God will be there with us. This is what God has desired from the very beginning. And we go all the way back to Genesis chapter one, when God created the heavens and the earth, he creates Adam and Eve. Why did he create them? Because God desired this relationship. God desired community. But then Adam and Eve, they chose to eat from this tree that God had told them not to eat of and sin entered into the world. And so ever since that time, God has been on this mission to draw us back to him. And I love John's description here of what heaven will be like. He says, God's gonna make a new heaven and a new earth. And there will be this beautiful city that is prepared like a bride does for a husband on their wedding day. And you know, as I was, I was thinking about that, it began uh, to make me think about my own wedding day. And I think about that day, and it, I can remember it so vividly, so, so picture perfectly, that day where uh, at our home church where Amanda and I grew up, the, the, all the bridesmaids walked down the aisle. Everyone had been seated. The, the, the flower girl and the, the ring bearer, they kind of made their way down the aisle. You know what I'm talking about, right? And then uh, the doors closed in the back of the church and that song ended. And then all of a sudden the, the next song began to kick up and the doors opened back up and they're standing at the back of the church is my beautiful bride, Amanda. And as she began to walk down the aisle that day, the tears began to flow because I realized on that day I was finally getting to marry my best friend. And you see, I imagine this, this day when this new heaven and this new earth come to be, it being much like the wedding day was for me. That God will be standing there waiting at the gates as the gates open wide and he will be ready to receive those of us in who have believed and accepted who he is and what he has done for us. All who have chosen to accept his invitation will receive access into this new heaven and it will be the most spectacular place. And God will be there with us just like he desired from the very beginning in the garden. And so as we look to the promise of heaven, ultimately what we get to look forward to is to be reunited with God himself. And you know, that's something that we should get excited about. Because we could, we could live in anticipation uh, of what's going on and, and things are good. You know, life here on earth is okay, but there's something better that we get to look forward to and that's what we need to look to. You see, this relationship that was broken by sin will finally be restored and that's enough for me right there. But it gets better than that. And John goes on to say this in Revelation 21 in verse five. He says, not only... Not only will, will God be there, but there's a promise that everything will be new. Notice what John says in verse five again. He says this, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Now, if you're following along in your Bible, I want you to underline just that one word, everything. Because what, what, what John is letting us understand here is that heaven will be this place where God will take everything 
And I mean everything that had been ruined, that had been destroyed by sin, and he will make it new again. It will be, be, be returned to its once glorious state. I like what C.S. Lewis says about this. He says, to enter heaven is to become more human than you ever dared succeeded in being on earth. I love that. I love this promise. You see, I want you to understand what that means for you and me. The, the promise of heaven is this, that we will be made new, that we will get new bodies, that we will get sinless bodies, we will get better bodies than we've ever had here on this earth. Paul wrote about these bodies in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Listen to what he says. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. See, the promise is this, that our lowly bodies, they won't be so lowly anymore and that's good news for me because that means that I don't have to get up at six o'clock every morning and get on the elliptical, right? And, and work out just so I can go to Brahms and get my German chocolate in a waffle cone. I like it. That's good news. We get a new body. We get, we get a better body. We get a glorious body. That is the promise of heaven. You know, it reminded me of the story I heard of a, a farmer who had never been to the big city before. So one day he, he told his wife and his, his son that he wanted to go check it out for the first time. And so they loaded up in the car and they drove into the big city. And as they were driving into the big city, he saw these skyscrapers and they were just amazed at everything that they saw. Well, they pulled up to one of the skyscrapers and the farmer parked the car and he turned to his son who was in the back seat and he said, hey boy, let's go get ourselves a big city newspaper. So the father and the son, they went into the skyscraper and the wife stayed in the car. And as they walked in, they were just blown away by the expansiveness of this lobby. And they, they looked toward the, the one back wall and they saw these nice shiny walls and they were just like, these are amazing. And all of a sudden they saw this older woman that was standing there. And, and all of a sudden those walls opened up and there was a room behind it. They had never seen anything like it before. The older lady walked in to the room and then the walls shut behind her. Then all of a sudden there were these lights that started to light up above the walls and these numbers were on them. And they just stood there mesmerized for the next 30 seconds and the numbers went up and then they, they came back down and all of a sudden those shiny walls opened back up and this beautiful 24 year old brunette walked out. <laughs> the father looked at the son and he said, boy, did you see what I did? The son shook his head and he said, boy, go get your mama, right? <laughs> you see, much like heaven, much like that, I think heaven will be just like that, it will be this instant transformation of our bodies, that, that we will be made new. And I, I don't know if that'll be a 24-year-old version of ourselves or a 30-year-old version of ourselves or even a 60-year-old version of ourselves, but the promise is that God, he is gonna make us new. Our, our bodies will be new. They will be glorious. It's version 2.0. And you know, it reminds me that my dad, who who a couple of years ago was diagnosed with Parkinson's, will get a new body. See, a few years ago when he got diagnosed with this disease, his nervous system began to shut down. And the things that he used to do, my dad was my hero, he can't do anymore. He can't play basketball with our son Blake when we go for a visit. He trips over his feet. He can't walk very good on his own. He has a hard time holding his plate, and a lot of times when he tries to put the fork to his mouth, the food never makes it there. And so over the last few years, every time I go to visit my dad, it seems as though the Parkinson's gets a little bit worse, and it gets a little bit harder for him to do the things that he could do when he was younger. And there's going to come a point in time in my dad's life where my, my dad's not going to be able to do those things anymore, and that he's going to need the help of someone else. But the good news is that there's a promise for all of us that there's a new body. And that one day this body that's here on this earth that isn't working for my dad will be restored, it will be repaired, and he will get a new body. And that's something that my dad gets to look forward to. That's something that, that, that we all get to look forward to. And can I just tell you, I cannot wait for that moment for my dad. I can't wait for that moment for each of us. God's promise is that he is going to make us new. But not only that, he promises not only do we get new bodies, but we get a new home as well. In verses 9 to 21, 
John talks about what that home will be like. Now, for the sake of time today, I'm not going to read all of those verses, but I do want to give you a description of, of what heaven is going to be like. You know, a few years ago, I was sitting at the dinner table with my kids one night, and I asked them the question. I think it was the last time I was doing a message on heaven, and I, I said, what do you think heaven's going to be like? And so our son, Blake, who was in early elementary school at the time, and uh, he, he started to answer the question, and, and he started to recite uh, the lyrics to this song that they sang in kids' church called Big House by this band called Audio Adrenaline. And as he told it, he was like, Dad, you're not going to believe it. It's going to be this big, big house. It's going to have all kinds of rooms. There's going to be this big table. It's going to have all kinds of food. There's even going to be a big yard, and we can play football, Dad. It's going to be epic. And you know, as he said that, I thought, you know what? That is the perfect description of what heaven is going to be like. That heaven will be this place where we will enjoy epic accommodations. Listen to just the mere size of heaven in verse 16. It says this, the city was laid out like a square, as long as it is wide. We measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia, 14,000 miles in length, as wide and high as it is long. You see, heaven is going to be this place that is massive. And then John goes on to describe a little bit more of what it looked like to the best of his ability. He says, the walls of heaven that will surround it, they'll be 200 feet thick. And then there will be these beautiful, precious stones that will line the walls. And the gates that enter into the city of heaven, they will be made out of the beautiful, the most beautiful pearl that you have ever seen in your life. And then you walk on the streets and these won't be any kind of streets Right? These streets will be made out of gold, pure gold. And there will just be this beauty that flows through there. And I think Chick-fil-A sauce will be the rivers that make it up, right? <laughs> That's how John describes what heaven will be like. That heaven will be this immaculate place, unlike anything that you have ever experienced here on this earth. Like, like I was trying to think about where I've been in my life that could even compare to it. You know, Disney like does a good job of making things look over the top and cool, but I don't even think anything that I've ever seen at Disney World or Disneyland could even compare to this incomparable place. A place that honestly I can't wait to see up close and personal. Because I guarantee you that it will be the most spectacular thing that you and I have ever seen. But you know, as I think about heaven, I think we have to go back to a few verses that we read right at the beginning here verses three to five that, that really kind of help describe what heaven will be like in a kind of a different way. You know, I think more than anything, we have to understand that heaven will be this place of, of perfect peace. And I want you to listen to verses three to five again and just really get this vision of what heaven is gonna be like. This is what John says. He says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne and said, I am making everything new. And then he said this, write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. And you know, as I was reading John's words here, preparing for this message, I couldn't help but think that John was helping us to understand something else about heaven that maybe we've never thought about before. And what John really wants us to understand is maybe a little bit about what heaven won't be like that maybe you never thought about it that way before. But I think heaven is gonna be so totally different than anything that we've ever experienced here on this earth. And look, John does his best, I think, to describe all that heaven will be like, but I kept coming back to verses three, four, and five because I think we get the ultimate picture of what heaven will be like because of what, what isn't gonna be there. Because when we get to heaven, God has promised that, that he's going to make everything new. That is the ultimate promise that he makes. But what does that mean? That's a question. Well, if we look at the words of John here, in Revelation 21, verses 3 to 5, what we, we see him say is this, that when we get to heaven, there's going to be no more death. There's going to be no more crying. There's going to be no more mourning. There's going to be no more pain. Do you see what John's saying here? He says, look, 
when you get to heaven, it gets better than anything that you've ever experienced here on this earth. No more means so much more than no more death or crying or pain. And as I began to think about it, I thought, you know, what does that actually mean for us? And so I started to listen this out and here's what I came up with. No more means there's no more pain medicines, cold medicines or multivitamins. No more means there's no more arthritis, lying in hospital beds, rides in ambulances, dentist visits or doctor's visits. And some of you are like, hey, that's something to look forward to. That's something I can get excited about. But there's gotta be more to it than that, right? And you're right, there's more to it than that. You see, no more means there's no more crime. There's no more murder. There's no more cheating or stealing. There's no more violence. No more means there's no more school shootings or abductions or abuse. No more means there's no more addictions. There's no more drugs. There's no more heroin overdoses. No more means there's no more fear. There's no more rejection. There's no more failure. No more means there's no more divorce or separated families. No more means there's no more lost jobs or foreclosed on homes because we've got a home in heaven that's already been paid for. Jesus paid the mortgage in full when he died on the cross for you and for me, but it doesn't end there. You see, no more means there's no more arguments or anger. No more means there's no more chemo or tumors. There's no more cancer. No more means there's no more disabilities or canes or wheelchairs or leg braces or crutches. No more means there's no more cyberbullying, Facebook rants, Twitter posts, Pinterest pins, or Instagram stories. And some of you are like, what am I gonna do when I get to heaven, right? Others of you are singing the hallelujah chorus because you just can't stand that stuff. But let me redeem this. No more means no more typhoons or tornadoes or hurricanes or floods or fires or earthquakes. No more means there's no more racism, there's no more hatred, there's no more prejudices. No more means there's no more denominations, associations, or organizations. There's just one body of believers and we're all living together. And I don't know about you, but that gets me excited thinking about what heaven's gonna be like, right? No more means there's no more starvation, there's no more neglect. No more means there's no more AIDS or Alzheimer's. There's no more Parkinson's for my dad. No more means there's no more dementia, blind eyes or deaf ears. No more means there's no more war. No more means there's no more IRS, FBI, CIA, NSA, TSA, or any of those other three letter agencies that we just can't stand. No more means there's no more CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, or or CNNBC or any of those others, but ESPN, I'm pretty sure it's gonna make the cut somehow. (laughs) No more means there's no more Cowboys fans, Philadelphia Eagles fans, or the sole Cleveland Browns fan, right? (laughs) Instead, we're all rooting for the same team. We're all wearing the same colors, which I guarantee you are gonna be scarlet and gray. I promise you that. (laughs) And the best part of it is this. The best part of it is this, that we will be together, every single one of us who has believed and accepted that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he is coming back. That's what we get to look forward to. That's what happens when we die, if we just follow him with our life. Now, here's what I do know. God's coming back. He is coming back. There is no doubt in my mind. And when God comes back, he is claiming victory over Satan. And God has promised that he is coming back to reunite us to him. He's coming back to restore that once broken relationship with those that he loved so much. So if you want to know what happens when we die, I think we get the perfect picture of it. In Revelation 21, 27, listen to what it says. It says, nothing impure will ever enter in, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, heaven is gonna be this place where God is gonna take everything that is broken and he is gonna make it so very good. Again, there will be no more pain or suffering or death. There will be no more tiny caskets. There will be no more uh, um, mental illnesses. There will be no more disease. There, There will be pureness that takes place. And that's something to anticipate, isn't it? That is something to anticipate. 
But let me just say this to you today. If you want to experience the goodness of heaven, please, please just make sure your name gets written in the book. And look, if you've never made that decision to follow Christ with your life, maybe today is the day where you need to do that. Because even though there's something that's better awaiting us, my fear is that there are some of you here today who could miss out. And I don't want that to happen for you. And I'm not trying to scare you into making a decision. But here's what I want you to hear. Heaven, as real as heaven is, and we can spend eternity there, there is another place that is just as real, and that place is called hell. Now, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about hell today because I want to talk about where I hope that you end up being one day. But hell is a place of eternity as well, and I don't want anyone sitting here today to end up there. And maybe today is the day where you need to make sure that you know where you'll spend eternity. Maybe today is the day where you need to make sure that your name gets written in the book. So here's what we want to do as we close out today. Today is a baptism weekend here at Compass North Fort Worth. And we already know, we, we have about eight people who have already said they were going to make that decision over the last week. And we're so excited about that. And so we're going to invite them in just a minute as we sing this song to come to the front. And there's towels that are on both sides here. And we want them, if you've already made that decision, we know that you're coming today. Just grab one of those towels and head over to our decision room right to the right here. But I also realize that there might be some of you here today who need to make that decision, the best decision that you can ever make. And so we wanna invite you to do that as well. And so today, as we sing this song, myself and some of our team are gonna be up front and around the room and just go to someone and say, I'm ready to do this. I wanna take that step. And you might be thinking, well, I I didn't bring anything. I didn't bring a change of clothes. I, I didn't, I don't have, I'm not prepared for this. Well, we were prepared for you. We've got the towels, we've got the change of clothes, we've got everything that you need, undergarments, we've got it all. So just come. If today is a day where you need to call upon his name, do it today. Don't wait any longer. Look, we don't know the day or the hour, but the promise is that God is going to return. Next week, we're gonna talk about that question, are we living in the end times? And I've got some answers to that question that I want to give you next week. But we know that Christ is going to return. And on that day when he returns, he's going to open those gates up. And it says in scripture that, that, that God will receive some of us in and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant, welcome home. But there will be others who will walk up to the gates that, that God won't recognize. And he'll say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. And he'll send them away. Make sure that isn't you. Because death doesn't have to be the end. But instead, it can be the beginning of the most amazing experience of your life. So maybe today is the day where you need to make that decision. I want to invite you right now to stand with us as we sing this song. And if you need to do that today, come to the front.